Okay, guys, um, this is lesson 17, Renaissance to the Baroque period. Um, so this chapter is going to be kind of broken down into three main parts, but mostly the Renaissance is what we're going to be focusing on here. Um, we'll talk a bit about the Baroque period and Rococo as well. Just some key differences in those. Um, the Renaissance is the first one to take place, and it's it's sort of chronological. So Renaissance first, Baroque second, Rococo third. Um, the Renaissance, there's a lot of technical advances happening um, and very profound subject matter as well. The Baroque period expanded um, the means of producing works and with some darker subject matter as well. So sort of a reaction to the Renaissance artwork that we see. And then Rococo is similar to Baroque as well, but it's much more decorative and playful rather than being more dark and like moody as Baroque is. So let's go ahead and get into it. <clears throat> so the Renaissance um, literally defines itself as the rebirth period. So before the Renaissance, we had a lot of... Um, there was just a lot of darkness. There was war, plague, um, all kinds of just like really, it was the dark times essentially is what we kind of reference it as. Um, and the Renaissance was sort of like this like coming out period and um, sort of trying to come back into normalcy and a lot of new things sort of happened because of this. We see humanism as a movement here. Um, it's a new philosophical, literary and artistic movement that um, really defines this period within the Renaissance. It's a time for achievement, exploration, and rediscovery. Um, and there's an elevation of the individual artist and not so much the middle age artist that we see um, as not really having like a, a, a name or, you know, a title to them. Um, if we think back to our craft chapter as well, and we, we think about that video we watched about, about the craft versus fine art discussion, um, th this, was, this was sort of like those defining things because in the middle ages, um, and also, you know, in non-European parts of the world, um, most artwork is created within like, it's it's more of a communal process. So, you know, one artist might do one part and the other artist might do a second part and so on and so on. Um, but you don't really like establish like, you know, you don't really have names like Leonardo da Vinci and Raphael and Michelangelo that are, you know, more notable, I guess, names. Um, and so that, that's a really important factor to this as well. We see a lot of realism or in depictions of light, space, and mass that emphasize physical reality of the spaces rather than it being, um, uh, really that's that's just to say there's a lot more of like academic focus in the arts rather than um, only like having apprenticeships and things like that. This is um, Giotto di Bandon, it's um, lamination. And this is um, kind of a combination of like the physical and spiritual realism. And you probably just watched lesson 16 as well when I talk about a lot of like symbolism and iconography in the more like eastern countries this is a great example of seeing that here um with like the little halos around the figures heads that are supposed to represent more spiritual figures um so yeah just just some, to know you know all parts of the world around you know these earlier times or traditional arts um have a lot of symbolism and iconography and are usually in some way or another connected to religion um, some early Renaissance art in Italy, there is the wealth of the merchants that enabled competition in the form of art patronage. Um, so we see, we start to see a lot of like elevation of individual names like Masico um, and the Holy Trinity. This is a very academic based painting. Um, we can see that there's the use of early linear perspective um, and, and really just a, a really keen focus on um, establishing like the elements and influencing the principles or the principles of design being influenced by the elements, which is, you know, something academic that is learned along the way and, and sort of a, a higher development in art when we start to really see those connections. Um, this is the first painting that's based on systemic use of linear perspective. Um, I think a lot of the times people think paintings like The Last Supper um, and other like, you know, kind of bigger names that use linear perspective are the first ones, but um, this one's actually quite a while before we even see Leonardo da Vinci's paintings being, being like using that. Um, we can see that there's the vanishing points. I remember linear perspectives when you have that horizon line, a vanishing point and converging lines. And that really plays into symbolism a lot as well. So right above the head here of Christ, um, it's where the vanishing point is. And that's definitely um, something that is intentional to create a lot of focus on the figure here. Um, we also see the illusion of figures composed in three-dimensional space um, and the bodies and the drapery are very, very realistic as well. 
Early Renaissance in Italy, um, as far as like sculpture goes, there's a popularity of the nude subject. And we can see in these, these sculptures, especially a lot of key differences between those um, from like the Eastern world and the, the um, Western world. So Eastern being like the more Asian and, you know, African co countries that we, we looked at and then the Eastern or the Western being like the European countries. Um, the Europeans really, really valued like this idyllic form that was almost so idyllic that it was unnatural in a way. It's, it's not something that like was easily, you know, an achievable body type really. Um, Donatello is um, the artist of this piece. It's done in bronze, but um, yeah, we see a lot of, of figures like this. And another thing to kind of note with um, the names of a lot of these, like David, for example, you probably all have a, a picture in your head of like the statue of David done by Michelangelo, not Donatello. Um, but there's lots of, there, there's lots of stories like biblical and like just um, mythological stories that tend to be over you and just figures in general that tend to be used over and over again. Um, so there are tons of Davids and it's, it's depicting this, this David guy here and, um, in, in a lot of different ways and a lot of different like formats. This is the first life-size freestanding nude statue since the Roman times. Um, David is obviously a biblical figure and he's using an expressive pose derived from this positioning called contrapposto. Um, and that's essentially just when in sculpture, there is more weight kind of like bearing on one leg than the other. And this one's sort of more relaxed. Um, it's just a very typical posing for, for figures around this time. Um, the high Renaissance, which is the part of the Renaissance that you probably know about a little bit at least, is between 1490 and 1530 in Florence, Rome, and Venice. Um, this is our names like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Raphael that come into fruition. Um, and another thing too, this is where uh, our, our project too really comes into play as well. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about any of these artists, but um, you should you should know about them based on like your findings there. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, he is the art and science as two, he uses art and science as two means to the same end, which is knowledge. I've talked a lot about this in the past, especially when we talked about like the medium of drawing and how he used sketchbooks to sort of inform, um, others about anatomy and, um, engineering and other things like that. But we know da Vinci's sketchbooks were very, very valuable, um, he studies anatomy and ideas for mechanical devices. This is the fetus in the womb. Um, it's a very accurate drawing um, of, of what that actually looks like. So just to kind of recap briefly, um, a lot of these drawings were super, super useful where Michael, or not Michelangelo, where Leonardo da Vinci was able to witness some of these things and, um, you know, be in the room during operations and surgeries and births and things like that. And he could actually see sort of like the 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 anatomy of it and so others you know wouldn't have to actually be there and experience it but they could look at his drawings that were very very accurate later on to understand the different anatomy of the person so very very helpful in science and um you know me medicine and all of these things we also obviously know Leonardo for the Mona Lisa. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the Mona Lisa. You're, you're welcome to kind of stay on this slide for a little bit if you're looking along with the PowerPoint, but obviously she has a very intriguing expression, um, soft blurring of the edges around the figure, and he uses a type of chiaroscuro within this as well, um, where the light's kind of coming from one side of the, the image. Um, one thing I will know just about this time in general is that the portrait of an individual is a fairly common practice in ancient Rome, but in humanism, which is what we talked about a little bit ago, an individual could be worthy of a portrait that necessarily wasn't like, you know, we're commissioning this portrait for a king or a queen or something like that. So think about like Yukio or uh, Yukioi in uh, Japanese art, where we kind of start focusing more on the individual, we start focusing more on like our everyday life, rather than having it to be this like, you know, over the top, like royalty kind of person. The Last Supper, um, we see a really great use of linear perspective here that again is very symbolic going over Jesus's head in the background there. Um, Jesus is seen as an accessible person who reveals his di divinity in an earthly setting. Um, we see the hidden geometry that strengthens the symbolism. Um, key here, the triangle <laughs> that is right here. There's a lot of chaotic kind of shapeage happening along the people that are more sort of like, you know, just arguing and fighting about the, the, what was going on, but Jesus is this symbol of, um, 
you know, kind of just stability as this triangle that he creates within himself. Um, again, this whole thing is based on one point linear perspective. And we can even see that the the vanishing point almost creates like a halo for Jesus to, to show his like divinity. This is Michelangelo's David. Um, it's the most powerful depiction of David as the hero and the defender of just cause. Um, this is larger than life. It is 14 feet tall, a very interesting size for um, a sculpture. It usually like life size would be like a better, or not better, but um, a more common way of depicting sculpture. But again, super idyllic body type, um, almost too rigid and too like muscular to even makes sense for, you know, an obtainable human body. Um, there are also some things that are a little bit out of proportion here, like the hands. And that's definitely symbolic as well for him to have those bigger hands. Sometimes that symbolized like strength and power. Um, but obviously, especially this hand, when you look at it, it's, it's just really kind of out of proportion with the rest of the body. Um, Michelangelo also did the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Um, Pope Julius II ordered Michelangelo to take on this commission. Um, it was a, a very, very big commission. Obviously, you can see by like the scale of the people down there, how truly massive this this church ceiling is. Um, something interesting about the the Sistine Chapel ceiling, though, is is there's a lot of paintings like this one here the creation of Adam that we think about as being more like individual paintings rather than it being part of a whole. Um, and so I think it's kind of interesting to break down this story into like individual sections rather than to see it like all in this giant scene here. Um, but yeah, a lot of these famous paintings, like the last judgment um, and, and other just like notable works that we maybe think as being individuals are actually part of the Sistine Chapel. Um, also something to note is that he's using fresco here. And if we think back on our painting lesson, fresco was very popular, especially before oil painting. Um, but you can see here, this is this, there's not a lot of like transparencies or layering or, um, uh, what am I trying to say here? Like varnishes over this to give it sort of like a tone or it, it kind of feels a little bit flat in a lot of ways. I mean, there's lots of dimension created by like implied light and color and things like that. But um, that the glazing processes that are possible with oil paint are not really used here. So it does sort of flatten the piece out. Um, just some kind of history about Michelangelo. Contemporaries around him regarded him as being rather difficult to work with. Um, he was, he held most in contempt and he never took on students or apprentices, which is sort of unheard of for someone of a name of his scale. Um, he created some of the most important works for the papacy, the Sistine Chapel, St. Peter's Cathedral, and was named a chief architect, sculptor, and painter by the Pope, which is a really, really big honor. That was not something that was really awarded to honestly anybody else that I'm aware of. Um, I'm not an art history, like, you know, major by any means or like, you know, uh, don't have that's not my specialty, <laughs> but as far as I'm aware, just from my own, like, you know, knowledge and schooling, um, I'm not aware of anybody else that was named um, a chief architect, sculptor, and painter that like all three of those things at this time. Raphael's our third major name. Um, he's a little bit different than the rest of them. He's the third major artist of the high Renaissance. Um, he had a warmth and gentleness that was really em emphasized in his work. Um, you can just tell this painting is very, very soft and just, um, feels very natural. Um, he uses oils, oil, or no, sorry, this is watercolor, but it just feels a lot softer than the work that Michelangelo was doing. And um, that was very, that was a very big signature of his style. So the Renaissance in Northern Europe, so we talked mainly about like Renaissance in Italy, um, but Northern European artists really, really flourished at this time as well. For example, John Van Eyck of Flanders, he's one of the most um, famous painters to use, and one of the first painters to use um, oil as his painting medium. His detail and depth is very believable. Um, and he has a very like the, the brilliance and the um, like the accuracy of the transparency of color used here is um, not obtainable previously. So this is a great comparison. If you look at this one and then go back to this piece here, it feel this automatically feels very flat when you compare it with a piece that's done in oil like this, that has such a depth to it that um, it just feels like you're actually there. There's so much detail to it. Um, this is the Arnold Feeney portrait. It was commissioned by 
um, I believe like a Lord and like his young wife that he was marrying at the time. And it's um, very significant. There's a lot of symbolic objects that indicate fidelity, fertility in a marriage and um, just all kinds of different symbols and things. Um, the, the dog is representative of something, um, the mirror in the background, the chandelier, the color of the dress, um, do with that information what you will if you'd like to research it further. Albert Dreher, another Northern uh, European Renaissance artist, um, he is German. He further developed his practice of combining symbolism with realism. This piece is a self-portrait. Um, uh, one thing about Dreher is that he is... Um, He's a little bit of a rebel in a way. He kind of uses imagery in a, in a, I don't know, just sort of coy way. Um, this piece, for example, is a self-portrait, but it looks a lot like a portrait of Jesus. Um, and lots of other people have made that accusation as well. Even things as small as like the hand placement, the hair, the creation of this triangular shape of his head there, um, all very much so something that you would do in a portrait of Jesus. Um but he claims it's just a self-portrait. Um, but yeah, he combines Christian sim symbols with familiar subjects. Um, but, you know, a lot of his his skill, it derives from Italian techniques and beliefs that we see in other Renaissance artists as well. Um, in the late Renaissance, we see the development of mannerism. This is when artists extended the question of the heritage that followed Raphael, Michelangelo, and da Vinci. Um, the masters, these masters were celebrated for seemingly reaching perfection during their time. And so the generation that followed um, really struggled with how to move on past that since perfection was already reached. Um, they created the words in the manner of preceding generations and other rebelled and cultivated mannered styles. So the style is called mannerism. So really, this is just like a big, a big time of rebellion for artists. They start to, this is, this is a good example of like, you have to know the rules to break the rules. So things in this piece like composition are just all over the place. So chaotic, um, not the way that you would be taught to organize a painting. Foreshortening is all off. All the layering is just really, really crazy. Um, really compressed space and the objects recede from the viewer in a kind of strange way. Um, but yeah, this is definitely a mannerism painting just based on how chaotic it is and how it, you couldn't, it'd be hard to not intentionally make a painting this chaotic, um, even if you didn't have any idea what you were doing. So this sort of developed, um, the, the mannerist really developed this tangled and problematic style. Um, and that was sort of like a signature for them. So in about 1600 to 1750, we start to see the arise of the Baroque period. This is when the artist mo or art moved in a direction of drama, emotion, and splendor, and set aside balanced harmony of Renaissance artists in favor of innovative use of space. Um, there is a lot of foreshortening and sharp diagonals, um, and it, it's sort of just an extension of mannerism in a way. They're sort of rebelling the Catholic Church, um, the Roman Catholic Church. And um, yeah, so there's just a lot of a lot of drama here. We start to see artists like Carbaggio, who is one of our biggest names in art history, I would say. Um, he's an Italian Baroque artist, and he uses an extreme chiaroscuro in all of his work, where this light source that's really dramatic is coming off from the side here, and there's like no other light source amongst the painting. So the rest of it that's not being hit by the light is just almost pure black. Um, his paintings are usually as well biblical scenes but the, it's very dramatic um versions of them like in here lots of extreme foreshortening being used um and it's it's called emotional realism that's perceived by some as too strong for those accustomed to images of represent representing um piety or like more um like calming imagery when it comes to biblical imagery um, we don't see a lot of female names, if not none, <laughs> um, around this time, but um, art, art is, I can never say her name right, Artis Migia um, Ginichelli is one of the artists that we start to see emerge as a female artist. This is a piece of hers called Judas and the Maidservant with the Head of Hoffernus. Um, it's influenced by Carvaggio uses very dramatic lighting, off-balance composition. This is a scene from the Old Testament where Judith beheaded a Syrian general, Hoffernus. Um, it's a very powerful scene for a female artist to create, especially in the 1500s. Um, you get in a lot of trouble for this if you were not the right person to be doing it. Um, and I'm sure that she did get in some trouble for this, for this scene specifically. Um, sculpture in Italian Baroque period is really, really, really dramatic as well. 
Um, this is Bernini's. I can, it's Gian Lorenzo. Um, Bernini's David, another David that we see as we saw before. Um, it's as influential as Caravaggio is in painting. It's a life-size, um, not monumental piece like the, the uh, Michelangelo's David. The Twisted Body depicts a drama and struggle, but just this positioning alone, it, it's really different from the two Davids that I showed you before. Um, there's a lot of like expression on the face there. Um, a lot of energy, a lot of just like kind of tension happening, very different from the ones that you've seen before. And it's very much Baroque. Another piece, just those flourishing fabrics that we see here, the body positioning being in motion, just like these expressions of just like, just raw emotion being seen here. And this is all in marble, just to kind of like put it in perspective. So Carving in general in marble is extremely difficult, but the the amount of detail that was able to be captured here, and then on top of that, to even like take it one step further, um, there's a skylight up at the top here. So this light is like naturally coming down and hitting this angel and this figure. Um, just really remarkable. This is called The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. Um, it's a portrayal of a vision from her diary. Again, skylight adds a light uh, to the drama of the sculpture. And this is a moment of really great emotional impact. Um, another thing to note about Baroque as well is that um, this is Baroque in Flanders in the Netherlands. They're still doing biblical scenes, but sometimes they do scenes that are less, um, less desirable or like less um, like powerful and like embodying strength and like, you know, nobility and that sort of thing. And sometimes they create scenes that are less idyllic for sure. Um, so another thing to note before I get too much into that, there's a new type of art patronage that starts to emerge. They favored more landscapes, still life, genre paintings, um, portraits, and so on. Um, this piece, though, by Rembrandt, is one of the Western world's most revered, he's one of the Western world's most revered artists. Um, but this piece is called Return of the Prodigal Son. It shows the influence of Italian Baroque painters. Um, and this is a biblical scene of a disobedient son returning after wasting his inheritance. Um, it portrays miraculous restoration of affection between a strange people, um, not a vision of a saint. So, um, yeah, just really, I think it's interesting the, the choice to, to paint this, um, but it's very telling of Baroque. Um, let's see here. I want to make sure I don't run out of time. Okay, sorry. Um, let's get back to where we were at. Um, John Vermeer, another great Baroque artist, he does genre paintings that raised a daily life to solemnity. Um, so again, kind of like that Yukioi style that we talked about before, just highlighting the individual. This is called the Kitchen Maid. Um, the light has a mystical quality to it and it makes pouring milk seem like a solemn ritual. Um, lots of really great color usage, texture, detail, and just an, an honoring almost of that of like, you know, a royalty. Um, I'm going to skip forward just because I'm a little bit worried. I'm going to run out of time. I'm, I'm kind of worried about compressing some of these videos, but this is D Diego Velasquez, um, a very complicated portrait of, of a daughter, um, of the king here. And it, it's just very, it's a very interesting piece. This is supposed to be a portrait just of her, but we start to see um, all these other like handmaids in the piece. We actually see Velazquez here that he's painted himself at, painting the piece of the daughter. We see the parents in the mirror there. We see this guy going out of the background. Very interesting piece. And then, like I said before, still life's really flourish here as well. Um, fruits or flowers um, are oftentimes arranged by artists and as well as domestic items um, and food items. The Netherlands um, more so celebrate the bounty of nature while Spain isolates a few items in dramatic light. This is Jean van de Hamen. Um, he sees the influence from both Spanish and Dutch schools and his still life with sweets and pottery do a really great job of showing bounty and just like flourishment. And, um, but also it, it, he's got this nice like black background here that feels like they're more isolated and you can kind of focus on individual items rather than getting too overwhelmed with too much. Lastly, Rococo, it's a light playful version of Baroque. Um, it's very enthusiastic sensuality. Um, and we see with architecture, especially just extremely over the top ornate, um, really striking use of gold and the, the chandeliers and like the wall ornamentation, murals on the wall that are depicting like just, you know, very green, luscious scenes, um, but very dramatic as well, just like Baroque. Um, 
the, the, these like romantic visions kind of free us from the life of hardship. And that's, that's really, they're just wanting it to be light and playful and, you know, like nice rather than it being, you know, hard and moody and dark. This piece is probably the most notable Rococo style piece. It's uh, Frig Fregonard's um, Happy Accidents of the Swing. Just this green, luscious, flourishing moments all in the background here. Just this playful, kind of sensual girl swinging here with her big pink fluffy dress and this guy sort of like lusting after her at the bottom there. Um, just really, really great example of, of Rococo. All right. That is it. I'm going to end it right here so that I'm not to go over our time slot, but um, that is all for lesson 17.